if a man trapped my mother, now it's just switched over. It's just switched over to the next video. If a man <clears throat> trapped my mother, the way she treats him, I wouldn't stand for it, neither would anyone else. And they would openly say, this is an abusive codependency. This ain't love. It may have once been love, but it's since mutated into some sort of real unhealthy, unhappy codependency. An abusive one. A very abusive one. She calls him. Bitches at him for a minute. He hangs up the phone. I say, what was that about? Oh, she's all pissed off because we're having fun. The reverse is also true. If us having joy and happiness and laughter brings her feelings of anxiety and pain, emotional pain, frustration, she's all pissed off because we're having fun, the same is also true. When you're in pain and anxiety and frustrated, it brings her happiness and joy. Schadenfreude, harm joy. We all have this in us. I engage in it occasionally, but I've caught myself doing it. I can see that other part of myself. And once you can, you can see other people operating from that part of themselves that they don't know exists. There is a mirror opposite of what we are truly looking for. We truly want joy and happiness for ourselves, right? We want to achieve all the things we want to achieve and acquire all the things we want to acquire. And when we can't, it feels almost as good to see someone else not acquire and achieve all the things that they want. We want to feel joy and happiness. But when we can't, it feels almost as good just to see someone else feel a lack of joy and a lack of happiness. My example I've used a bunch of times before is when you get on an F on a test. Oh, God, I feel like crap. Your buddy, you see he got an F. Oh, you got an F too? Oh, I don't feel so bad now. Schadenfreude, harm joy. So that spirit has driven him his whole life during our relationship. <clears throat> and I guess I'll get around to the point of this abusive codependency that they have. You cannot be miserable enough to make someone else happy. You cannot be poor enough to make someone else rich. Like, you know, poor people like to rail against the rich. Oh, those assholes, that fucking dirtbag on the hill. In fact, when we were in the trailer court, because when I came into Doug's life at 16 years old, they still lived in the trailer court. By the time we were 18, we were up here on the hill. In a house that we would have previously pointed at and said, look at those dirt bags. How do they rank? How do they rate? What the fuck do they deserve that I don't? That mirror opposite of what actually brings you joy. Joy is the feeling you get when you're doing what's in alignment with your true nature. And anything that brings us those opportunities to feel that joy or increases our capacity to feel that joy, we say, I love that thing, whether it's the job I have, the woman, the car, the house, the boat, the yacht, whatever brings you joy, an external source, and it can even be from yourself. But we won't complicate it. We'll say external sources that bring you opportunities to experience joy or increase your capacity to experience joy. You say, I love that thing. A hammer, a hammer gets joy from hammering nails. That's what's in alignment with its true nature, what it was designed to do. A can opener gets joy out of opening cans. That's what it was designed to do. A hammer gets no joy out of opening cans. A can opener gets no joy out of driving nails. If I were to bring the hammer nails, opportunities to experience joy, it would say, I love you. If I were to retrofit the hammer to where it can drive three nails at once and increase its capacity to experience joy, it would say, I love you. That's the difference between bringing you opportunities to experience joy or increasing your capacity to experience joy. Joy is the feeling that we get when we are doing what is in alignment with our true nature. Here's a very left brain analytical definition of love. We say we add the label of love to any external source that brings us joy or in, in, uh, opportunities to experience joy or increases our capacity to experience joy. Joy is the feeling we get when we're doing what's in alignment with our true nature. <clears throat> there is a mirror opposite. Good wolf, bad wolf. Angel, devil. There is a mirror opposite that feels almost as good. And you can almost not even tell the difference. Because just like when you're looking in a mirror, it's the same exact image reversed. 
So you can't tell the difference and you wouldn't even know it was reversed unless you study it closely like raising your right hand and realize, oh, the dude, the dude in the mirror is raising his left hand. Looks, feels exactly the same is the exact opposite of joy. It's harm joy. We get joy doing what is in alignment with our true nature, building other people up, creating and producing. Or we get schadenfreude from destroying and tearing other people down, blowing out other people's candles. And that's what she does to him all day long. Beat him over the head with anything she can to make him feel littler and littler and littler. To make herself feel bigger and bigger and bigger. And allowing yourself to be abused by someone does not make you a better person. Nor does it show how much you love them. Flip the script. Put it in an abusive relationship where the man is the abuser and the woman is the abused and everything I'm saying is true and everyone knows it. She will make excuses and say, oh no, he loves me and that's, that's how I show my love for him is just by letting him abuse me like that and the more he abuses me uh, and I let him in and smile and say, I still love you. That's not love. That's an abusive codependency. And I think he believes in his ultimate scorecard when he stands before God that all the shit he swallowed from her will be to his benefit and show that what a good person he was. Because he let her treat him like shit and the worse she treats him, the better he feels about treating her good. Because look how shitty she treated me and I still treat her good. And the shittier she treats me, the better person I am because I still treat her good. The shittier she treats me, the more it shows I love her because I still treat her good. And this is the basis of their relationship. More recently, it's taken a real dive into a downward black hole spiral. Since she got a colostomy bag and desires people's witness so bad... It's like a boy who needs sex and has a one-track mind, that urge, that primal instinct, and the need to fulfill that one primal instinct that overrides your cognitive abilities, and suddenly your brain stops working until you have that orgasm and suddenly your senses kick back in. We've all had that experience. It's the basis of the movie Coyote Ugly. You know how a coyote, if it gets caught in a trap, it'll chew off its own arm? The Coyote Ugly is some stripper lady. I never saw the movies. I just, uh, the movie. I just heard the explanation that when you wake up in the morning after going home from the bar with someone, and you wake up next to them, and they're so ugly. You're like, oh my god, what did I do? You'd rather chew your arm off in order to be able to get out of the bed and out of the house without them waking up than to wake them up and go, ah, oh, hey, hey, hey. My point is. That drive, that primal instinct that made you go home with them that night without thinking. And as soon as you have that orgasm, it's even like in a rap song. As soon as I come, I come to my senses. Yep. That primal instinct that drives you and overrides your cognitive abilities, your thought processes. It's a natural instinct. And a desire that needs fulfilled so bad that everything else goes to the wayside. And then once that desire is fulfilled in this sexual example, then your senses kick back in. Your consciousness. Until then, you're acting from the uh, limbic system. The brain that's in your stomach. Not your higher level consciousness. The brain that's in your root chakra, I suppose. Won't even get into that. <clears throat> So my mom has such a deep desire for witness, she's willing to rape someone's witness in order to get it. She doesn't care about all, like, like a boy who ends up raping a girl, sacrifices any and all of these other things that we could have in this relationship because there's that one thing that I want fulfilled so bad. And she says, no, I've got my line, I've got my boundaries, I'll do this, this, but I don't want to participate in that activity. I don't want to have sex. One day he don't care what you want. He wants what he wants so bad. He's willing to take it from you, even though you've expressly said, that's an activity I don't want to participate in. Part of him takes over, a primal instinctive drive. 
And then afterwards, he realizes what he did, and it's too late. Witness is something we need so bad, we'll kill for it. And if we don't get it, we might kill ourselves. There was a point in my life where I almost did just that. Because when I found my implant, no one would give me witness. Like the people at the house next door, they said, no, close the door, close the door, shut the drapes. I don't want nothing to do with it. Is the way people shut me out. When I said, look what I found. My brother-in-law, I don't want to feel it. Doug, I don't want to feel it. I had to force both of them. I said, fuck you. You just want to be able to have me walk out of the room and still talk about how I'm crazy. Feel this. Here, let me grab your hand and force you. You feel that? Okay, I guess I will. Okay. That was how it went with Doug. That was how it went with my stepbrother. Dana was willing to feel it. And after she felt it, she was like... Dude, you gotta feel Justin. Come here. Come here. You gotta feel this. He really does have something there. He's like, okay. Fucking twist my arm. But at the time, <laughs> at Justin's house on that first day, I was saying, well, I wanted to come out and get out there into the sunlight as quickly as I possibly could with as many people as possible. He said, what? So they gotta come snuff us all out in order to keep it back under wraps? I was like, yeah, that's kind of it. That's kind of the idea. Just like whistleblowers need to get their story out there. And once they got their story out there, it's a hedge of protection. But until you get your truth, your whistleblower truth that you're sitting on out there, you're in danger. They might just snuff you to keep you from getting it out there. That's why you need to get out there into the sunlight with it. And this was like a week after I'd found my implant. So I'll just wrap this up about the witness and get back on to we'll come back to the witness. There's this anger pity justification dynamic that came to me in a three ring vision. The whole concept complete. Not the way I'm about to convey it to you, line upon line, precept upon precept, until you've got the final conclusion and then you recognize what all that stuff leading up to it was once you finally get the aha. Came all in one package. Three ring vision. At the bottom, a little Bunsen burner with a flame coming up out of it. Above that, a Petri dish. In that Petri dish, all the things you feel guilty and shameful for, and that flame is the fear of alienation and rejection for those things that you feel guilty and shameful for. And because you feel guilty and shameful for these things, and you fear alienation and rejection, in order to compensate for those things that you feel guilty and shameful for, you project anger outward at others, reflecting pity back upon yourself as justification for those things that you did that you feel guilty and shameful for, in order to avoid alienation and rejection. Children do this. As soon as the mom starts scolding them, even before they even know what they're in trouble for. She did this and he did that. Why did you why did you do this? Because she pulled it, she called him a name and, and and he bit her, and that's why I pulled her hair. Trying to get their parent to direct their anger at this other kid and, and pity upon me. Cause their fear of alienation and rejection by their primary caregiver starts kicking in as soon as they know they're in trouble. This is going to wrap around to God and how no one's in trouble, okay? So the kid demonstrates this by trying to redirect the parents' anger toward anyone else around them, their brothers, their sisters, someone else for doing something else, to reflect pity upon themselves as justification for what it is they think they're in trouble for. A parent does the same thing when they tell their kid, you should be lucky I'm your parent. My parents did this to me, and that to me, and that to me, and that to me. Anger towards my parents, pity upon myself, justification for the way I'm raising you. You should feel lucky I'm your parent. My parents, blah, blah, blah. I had a vision last night. It's the same vision I've had before. I'm going to re-upload a video that I've had, that I already made about how we are like children. Children naturally, from a broken home where the parents get a divorce, the children feel like it's their fault. If I was a better better kid, mom and dad wouldn't have gotten divorced. In this case, in the cosmic family that we're all part of, 
we're told, yeah, it was your fault. God left us because your original sin, whether it's the one in the Garden of Eden or everything else you've done along the way, it was because you're a bad kid that our celestial parents abandon us. That's not the case. The vision I got last night was a kid crayon on the wall, kid sitting there scribbling crayon on the wall and their parent walks around the corner and as soon as they look up and they see their parent, they start crying. Because they know they're in trouble for what they're sitting here doing. No one's in trouble. Mom and dad aren't mad. They're really happy with some of us because even in a household, some of us went and cleaned the walls off, cleaned up behind our brothers and sisters, sacrificed some of our own food when there was a lack of enough to go around to keep everyone else from fighting. One of the way I did this was literally going and doing their dishes because for some reason they couldn't do that for themselves. And it would create fighting in the family. So on a regular basis, I would go do their dishes. Because on a regular basis, there was an argument of whose turn it is to do the dishes. I did them last. You better get her to do it. I'm not doing them unless she does them. That special golden child about Melanie being the priority and this being a split family lasted clear to the point where Mariah's supposed to have her day doing dishes. And Doug says, no, I'll do dishes on Mariah's day. And Shana says, fuck that. Mariah does dishes on Mariah's day, or I ain't doing dishes. I don't care if you're going to do them for her. Then do them on my day and everyone else's day. In order to stop this fighting, I would just go do the dishes as often as I could. Gave a couple of other examples where I've gone above and beyond when it really mattered. And when I do something for someone and I give, I rarely remember what I've given to them like my ex-girlfriend Amber, I would have to literally forget about the shit that she's done to me in order to keep loving her. And when I've done something for someone else, I also write it off in order to not keep this ongoing scorecard of what I did for you so you owe me. Because if you keep that scorecard in your mind, then essentially you didn't give anything. You gave on the contingency that some someday you'll receive in return. And that's why you're keeping this running list of things that you did for me is so it's an IOU, so one day you can say, now you owe me a favor for all these things I did for you, remember? And that's why these people have a self-serving selective memory when it comes to this scorecard they keep. They don't remember all the things I did for them. They would prefer to remember all the bad things I did to them. All the things I did for them, good, and all the things I did to them, bad. They exaggerate and inflate anything that can be held on this ledger, on this side of the ledger, and they minimize and detract and deflect and forget about and completely erase things on this side of the ledger that I did for them. And when it comes to the other side, things they did for me and things they did to me, things they did for me that are good and things they did to me that are bad. They like to inflate and elevate and exaggerate the things they did for me and just kind of forget about those things they did to me. And in this way, their self-serving selective memory keeps this running scorecard that is so detached from reality That if I was to operate on the same scorecard, I couldn't, uh, couldn't be here anymore. <clears throat> so back to uh, the anger-pity justification dynamic. After we go, Doug got an ignition put in his Honda. We go to pick the car up, drive it away, and it dies a couple blocks down the road. Apparently it wasn't just the ignition, there's something else wrong with it. He said, I'll oh, just take it home. I'm done with it. I'm done. I said, dude, we're still two blocks away from the place he just picked it up. You take it back to him now, and he kind of has the onus to fix it right this time. So basically, I talked him into taking it back. 
And after we drove home, because while we took it back and told him, you know, I don't know what the hell's wrong with it. He said, well, you could sell it. And Doug's like, yeah, 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 but I wouldn't want to do that to someone. You know, that's messed up. The next day, he pulls up in the driveway with that car. Comes up and tells I didn't ask him, what are you doing? I didn't go ask him his business. He comes up and runs his smoke screen on me about how he went back to the dealer or the, the repair shop and said, I can't afford to get, uh, I, says, I can't afford to spend any money on this car. You just give me a list of things that it might be and I'll, that I can check. And so he gave me a list of things and one of them was the air cleaner. There's like, the, you know, the mass airflow sensor. There's three sensors in there, you know, and I used a half a can of this air cleaner. It's running great. As soon as he starts running this shit, I'm like, I'm running great. It wasn't a matter of whether or not it runs great. When it runs, it runs good. And when it doesn't run, it doesn't run. It's not a matter of sometimes it runs better and sometimes it runs worse. It either runs or it don't is what the problem is. But he tells me, yeah, I sprayed this air cleaner on the sensors inside the mass airflow, inside the air inductions. It's got three sensors. Yeah, three. And now it runs great. I'm going to clean it up. At first I said, so it runs great until it doesn't? Well, I don't know. We'll see. As if because it lasted for five minutes, it's fixed and good to go. But we didn't get but six blocks away from the repair shop, and it died. And on the way back to the repair shop, it died a couple times again. So if it did make it all the way from the repair shop back to here, that's an improvement. But I can tell just by his words. So while he's telling me it runs great, I was like, it runs great. I uh, tell it doesn't. Well, I don't know. We'll see. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to clean it up. It's running great. I'm going to clean it up. I come back. I, I, I come back and I'm like, you mean clean it up and sell it. But you didn't say that part because you already feel guilty about what you're about to do. Well, I'm going to drive it for a while. I was like, so you do or you don't have intentions of selling it? I can't tell. And I left it at that. <clears throat> Had I driven the point, because I can tell exactly what he's going through, he would have used the anger pity justification dynamic. Well, why should I give a fuck if I sell someone else a lemon? No one else gave a fuck about me. I've always gotten the short end of the stick. No one's ever uh, uh, withheld from leaving me holding the bag. Anger at all those other people that screwed me over. Pity upon me. Justification for this thing that I'm about to do. And the whole reason he even came and started blowing his smoke screen my way is because he fears alienation and rejection from me. I didn't come asking you what you're doing or uh, put my nose in your business. You decided to come over to me, start running your smoke screen on me, and now I'm the bad guy because I can tell you, <clears throat> I see right through you. And that's why I can't even be around these people sometimes anymore. I try to help them tow a car. It's more important to him to settle some internal scorecard that he doesn't even know he has. He gets driven by an impulse. Biobot transceivers, spiritually hijacked, driven by impulse. We're getting to a time where I think people are driven more and more by those impulses. And that bad wolf is going to take over more and more often. But in this case, he came over telling me all about how it runs great now. And how he's just going to clean it up. But he fails to mention that he's going to sell it. Fear of alienation and rejection. Things he feels guilty and shameful for. So he's pre-paving the path to tell me, oh, it runs great. So when I sell this to someone, I fixed it. I figured out what's wrong with it. It was these airflow sensors and yeah, it runs great. Until it don't. Well, I don't know. We'll see. So I'm going to fix it up. I, I mean, so I'm going to clean it up. You mean clean it up and sell it? But that's the part you didn't say is and the reason you didn't say sell it is because you already feel guilty. It's called consciousness of guilt. You're demonstrating that you have a guilty conscience by leaving the word sell it out of the sentence. Just wanted to tell me about how great it runs and that you're going to clean it up.
So regarding those things that make us feel guilty and shameful for the things we've done, that relates to the fourth step in Alcoholics Anonymous, where you make a personal moral inventory of the exact nature of your wrongdoings in front of yourself, another human being, and God. And when and where possible, you make amends to those who you've wronged. But it's not always applicable. If you cheated on, if you uh, did your, your best friend's wife, you don't go telling them that so you can feel better about yourself. If she chooses to do that, you don't go break up their relationship so that you can feel better about yourself. There are certain exceptions and it's a fine line. But if you don't do that personal moral inventory, you'll get fucked up again. My sister, the one that I told you, uh, was there with me and I took her to her first AA meeting. And her name's Melanie and her boyfriend at the time name was Jason. And on our way to the meeting, she says, uh, Jason wants to get sober too. And I said, you ask anyone here about relationships and sobriety, they'll all tell you the same thing. Oh, okay. We get there. They open the meeting with the preambles and the standard thing. Anyone got a topic they'd like to talk about? Dude raises his hand, relationships and sobriety, I'd like to talk about that. She looks at me like, oh, cool. Says, hi, I'm, my name's Jason, I'm an alcoholic. She looks at me again. And as he's telling his story about his girlfriend, he says, blah, 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 and Melanie this, or her, my, my girlfriend's name's Melanie. She looks at me and says, that's fucked up. Because my, my sister's name is Melanie. Her boyfriend's name is Jason. And we were just talking about relationships and sobriety on the way into that meeting. After the meeting, she talks to some people and explains what just happened. And they say, yeah, you got God smacked. It happens all the time around here. It's the most bizarre thing. It blows people's mind. But yeah, you just got God smacked, girl. She got about six or eight years of sobriety off the heroin and meth. And now she's back on the shit. Has been for quite a while. But at least she got another six or eight years to raise her daughter from 12 years old till 18. The reason she's back on the dope is because she didn't go through that process of cleaning out your closet, looking in that closet at all the skeletons of the things you feel guilty and shameful for and make, making amends where possible. Because if you do that and you go through the pain of looking at yourself that honestly, next time you have an opportunity to make a decision to fuck someone on a car or something or make a decision and do something you're going to feel guilty and shameful for, you choose the high road because you went through the pain of looking at the low road that you took all those different times and you don't want to go through that pain again. If you don't go through that pain, you've still got a closet full of skeletons, so what does it matter if you add another one and another one and pretty soon you're back on the dope? Those things that we were told are the fundamentals that determine the difference between a good life and a bad life that we kind of dismissed and forgot about along the way and acted like, yeah, that's good for storybooks and telling kids, but it's a, here in the real world, cheaters win and, and, and uh, liars prosper and none of that shit really matters. It does. Instant karma is going to get you. The karma chameleons are here. The consequences of our actions are about to be had because there is no such thing as truth or morality without consequences. So we went without the consequences for a long time. We thought so long that we thought there really is no truth or morality or reason to abide by any of those principles. <clears throat> Turns out there is, and it's time to pay the Pied Piper. But mom and dad ain't mad at us. I'm going to upload a video that I already made regarding this, how we are like children whose older brother and sister enslaved them while mom and dad went on a vacation. And that older brother and sister told us some lies about how dad's going to whip our ass and how dad left because we're bad kids our sins. Another analogy I make is like one parent who alienates the children from their other parent. Usually it's a mother who alienates the children from their missing father. Tells them what a piece of shit he is. So the kids are trembling in fear and think he's a, a, a mean guy. <clears throat> They're really happy with some kids who went above and beyond to help uplift their siblings instead of tear them down. To help maintain some sort of semblance of decency here within the household. 
There are some of us who have developed and emotionally matured enough that we are ready for our own household and our own children. But just like in the real world, in the 3D physical world, like a teenage mother, <clears throat> I have a sister who kind of resembles some of the things I'm about to say, but I won't mention her. She knows who she is. Gimme, gimme me first, I me my. You can't show your children love. There's two, two types of uh, ways to raise a kid, either positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement with the rewards of the goodies if you do good or the threat of the punishment if you do bad. Some people were never raised in an environment where they had nurturing, loving, uplifting people to show them the way. They had someone to beat them down and hit them over the head and tell them what a fuck up you are. And how your dad's going to beat your little ass when he gets home, you little fucker. You just wait. Some people, like teenage mothers, who still want to party and play, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, resort to the negative reinforcement because it's easier to just threaten that little bastard. You better shut the fuck up or I'm going to smack you. You hear me? And when that's all you've been shown and that's all you know, then you can't give what you don't have. But somehow, some of us, even though we lived in an environment where the level of love and respect and appreciation and morals and ethics was down here, even though we had never seen that and the people around us never demonstrated any higher level of understanding of these things, we developed personally relevant, personally meaningful principles, standards based on underlying priorities. And my dad... And that car was a case of you can't teach an old dog new trick. What's your priorities? Cash or karma? Cash or karma? All of our lives can be boiled down to A or B, ones and zeros. The decisions you make are based on the underlying priority, which is more important, A or B. Well, I want both. Well, you got to make a decision because you can't have both. You always got to choose which is more important. Well, they're both important. Well, which is more important? In this case, it's cash or karma. Cash or karma? Well, cash. <laughs> I don't believe in that karma shit. I've lived my whole life as if it doesn't exist, and I can't afford to start sacrificing the cash now for the karma. And if karma is real, I got a closet full of skeletons that I owe. So I can't afford to start living that way now. I got to go for the cash. And stick it to whoever gets fucked over this car that I'm going to give him. Even though he's got five licensed and registered vehicles here. And the person who gets that car is going to need a transportation. And then they're going to have given him their money that they had for transportation. Get a few blocks down the road and when it shuts off and they call him and say, What the fuck, man? You sold me a lemon. Oh, it was, deal was as is. It was fine. It ran great when I gave it to you. Even at this 11th hour, they still can't find it in themselves. He doesn't need that cash. He's not broke. Even if he was, he could rearrange some of his priorities of what he spends his money on. It's only a $1,600 car that he got. And just a short time ago, my mom was driving the little $500 beater red truck till I started paying them $200 a, month, uh, $200 a week. Shortly after, she got the $1,600 upgrade. And recently, they went and financed a new car. Just a short time ago. On that note, after I got back from Missouri, I was down to my last 36 cents. I had racked up my credit card emptied my bank account, and out there my gas tank was empty, and that's why I got my car towed. I called my sister. She gave me a credit card number so that they would tow it to a residence rather than to the impound yard. I paid her back that 200 and whatever it was, because when I called her, I said I got one more check coming from Uber here in like a week. It's like a bonus they said is coming or whatever. That bonus came through. I paid her back.
after she gave me a credit card number to get my car towed, <clears throat> my mom, Doug, I think they wired it to Walmart. And I went and picked it up from Walmart. They gave me uh, like 300 bucks cash to get back here with for fuel in the tank. At the time, I hadn't eaten in three days. And when I did finally eat a sandwich, I threw it back up. Before I ate that sandwich, I could feel my intestines starting to devour themselves. That smell and that taste that you get when you're sick, you, you know you're sick because the, the smell and the taste of your own phlegm. My internal organs were starting to digest themselves. When I got back here, Doug was giving me $100 every two weeks saying that's all he could afford. And I told them one day, I'm going, to remember, I'm going to remember this. You wanted to help me back up from face down in the gutter, back up to on my knees, but you don't want to help me back up onto my feet because you're afraid if I roll away, I won't roll back this direction real soon, and I'm going to remember that. That's a lyric from a Jack Johnson song where he sings how I locked my bike to yours because he was afraid that if she rolled away, she wouldn't roll back this direction real soon. That day, they coughed up 300 bucks. The next day, all in one day, I went and got a new pair of shoes because the ones I was wearing had holes in them from the walking I did in Missouri. Same pair of shoes I broke my foot at, uh, my, my foot in down the road, trying to work up that 300 bucks. Anyway, they give me 300 bucks. I go get a new pair of shoes. I get my cell phone turned on. I go down to the doctor's office and get my medical card updated. I take that medical card down to the DMV and get my CDL reinstated and stopped at Mountain States Trucking and delivered my resume. And that's the job that I worked at for the next year and a half, going on two years. And they pay weekly. From the very first week check I received, I gave them $200. 